Wednesday. Tonight's speaker, Gabor Basri, received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics from Stanford and his PhD in Astrophysics from the University of Colorado. A Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship Award brought him to UC Berkeley in 1982, followed by a full professorship in 1994. He worked on high energy observation of newly forming stars and later became an early pioneer and world expert in the study of brown dwarf planets. He's a co-investigator on the Kepler mission and serves on the board of the Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, this is uh, the third time that Gabor Basri will be speaking to us. He talked to us in 2006 and again in 2013. Tonight he will discuss whether red dwarf planets are habitable. Most of the news about um, exoplanets over the past year or so has revolved around the idea of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone of red dwarf stars. Professor Basri will talk about these discoveries, give a background on red dwarf planets, and concentrate on the current thinking about whether a planet around object number 2027, which is a red dwarf, could in fact actually harbor life. This question is still a very active one, and we will learn why and how research is evolving. Join me in welcoming Professor Gabor Basri. Well, good evening, everybody. I like to move around a little bit. <laughs> thanks, thanks for coming out. So uh, Linda gave you the abstract for my talk, and you've been looking at all this stuff here. So I guess I'll just launch in. Let me just say uh, that I do encourage questions during the talk. Uh, often this talk gets so many questions that eventually I have to stop encouraging them. <laughs> but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. We'll, and and I'll, I'll, of course, answer questions afterward as, uh, as well. So let me first uh, say a little bit about red dwarf stars. Um, these are easily the most common kind of star that there is. So people like to say our sun is an average star. It's not. Our sun is, is uh, larger than average, brighter than average, and not that common. This uh, block here shows the near space population of stars within about um, 10 parsecs of here. Uh, so the yellow ones are like our sun. Uh, these are hotter, these are the K dwarfs, a little bit cooler. You can see most of them are the red dwarf stars. Those are about half the mass of our sun or less, about a half down to a tenth. Um, here, here's the actual distribution of, of stars near, near our sun, and again, you can see uh, most of them are red dwarfs. So um, the, a few other fun things about red dwarfs. Um, all red dwarfs that have ever been born are still alive. They're still going to be alive when the universe is twice as old as it is now. They'll still be alive when it's eight times older than it is now. Uh, red dwarfs are really long lived. Uh, so the current age of the universe is about a tenth of the, the life of the shortest lived red dwarfs. The really long ones live for like a, several trillion years. Um, and so uh, actually you can imagine Planets are probably die long before their, their stars do, <laughs> in the case of red dwarfs. Um, so if this is just, you know, the, it's the most common, um, we also have found that, that Earth-sized planets are more common around red dwarfs than they are around uh, solar type or, or more massive stars. Then probably most of the planets that are Earth-sized that are in the habitable zone are in fact around red dwarfs. Um, so, so it's worth probably thinking about whether uh, there might be any life there. Why are they called red dwarfs? Well, they're red. Um, that's because they're, they're cool. Um, so they have something like half the surface temperature of the sun down to like a third or less. Um, and they're, well, small. Um, so. The mass and the size of the star are kind of fairly well related in, the, in this realm. So if it's half the mass of the sun, it's also sort of half the size of the sun, um, and so on. Uh, the, the, big, the big difference is brightness or luminosity. 
So red dwarfs, uh, although you know, it may be half the mass of the sun, it might only be a, hun a hundredth the brightness of the sun. And so red dwarfs are somewhere between a, a hundredth and a ten thousandth as bright as our sun. So the ones that are a tenth solar mass are, are this, only this bright. And that means that if you want to have a planet that's at a comfortable temperature, you need to bring it much closer to the star uh, to get that temperature, just because these red dwarfs are very, are very faint. So that, you know, the biggest thing about them isn't, isn't so much that they're cooler or smaller. The, big, the biggest thing about them is they're much, much fainter. Um, so here are some actual scale uh, pictures of some famous red dwarfs. Uh, this, this is actually the closest star to us. You probably have heard that Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. That's actually a binary star, so there's Alpha Cen A and B. Uh, but there's a third star that moves through space along with that, that binary pair, and that's a red dwarf, and it's called Proxima Centauri because it is, in fact, nearer to us than, than the, the solar-type pair. So here's a picture of Proxima Cen. Um, here is a picture of a planet that was discovered in the last year and a half or so around Proxima Cen. Uh, here's the Earth. Um, here's the sun to the same scale. So you can see Proxima is not very big. In fact, this is Jupiter and Saturn also to the same scale. So these red dwarfs are really not much bigger than our giant planets. In fact, some of them are, are pretty much the same size. Here's, here's another one that you may well have heard about. It's called Trappist-1. Uh, you know, the, the names of these things, Proxima Centauri is a name that's been around for a long time. Trappist-1 was a name that was given to it by its discoverers. Um, they, they have an acronym that Trappist spells out, but really uh, it was named after Trappist beers. The Trappist monks in Belgium um, <laughs> make this, this line of beers, and, and these are Belgian astronomers, and so that's really what, that's really what it's about. <laughs> um, and it was the first, first uh, object they found. That this was a search for, for transits around red dwarfs. Um, that one is, uh, is, is about a tenth the, the mass of the sun, so it's really not much bigger than Jupiter. And here are its planets, uh, again, to scale. Uh, and here are Jupiter's moons also to scale. So uh, the, this system actually isn't that unlike the Galilean moon system, except that these are Earth-sized and slightly larger um, planets. Okay, so how, how do we find planets? Um, well, the main way now <laughs> is through using transits. I, I imagine pretty much everybody knows what that means, so I won't dwell on this. It's, you really, of course, you don't see the disk of a star for any star except our sun. What you do is you measure the brightness of it, and if a planet crosses in front of the star, the brightness drops while the planet's in front of it. That, that's the transit method. Uh, and this, this is all you see, you don't see this. But you know, if you, if you could see Jupiter transiting the sun, it would look something like this. Uh, this is actually Venus transiting the sun. So that's an Earth-sized planet transiting a solar-sized star. Um, the change in brightness that you drop here is just the area of the planet over the area of the star. So for Jupiter, which is about a tenth the size of the sun, that's a 1% drop in brightness. That's pretty easy to measure these days. But for an Earth-sized planet, it's a ten thousandth. So, so the brightness of the star only drops by one part in ten thousand. If you want to measure that, your, your accuracy had better be, you know, a few parts of, in a hundred thousand uh, in order to deal with noise. So you have to go above the Earth's atmosphere to do, to do that. Our atmosphere is just too murky for that kind of measurement. Uh, the other thing about this is, if you, let's say you were on some other star system trying to measure the Earth, uh, so you'd see this drop of one part in 10,000, you know, and then you'd have to wait for a whole year, right, for the Earth to get back around and transit the star again. So, and the, all, basically all planetary transits last for a few hours. So the duty cycle is very, very low for that situation. Uh, and if you're trying to do that from the ground, you know, half, first of all, half the time is wasted because it's daytime. You can't measure the star. And then you've got clouds and all kinds of things as well. So it turns out that it's quite difficult to do this from the ground, although 
these, these transit surveys just pound away at it and they have had some success. But if you get into space, uh, it's way, way easier. Um, but this is still kind of tough. So, but now it was, it was the area of the planet divided by the area of the star. So now if we go to red dwarfs, the star got a lot smaller. So this could also be a picture of an Earth-sized planet transiting a red dwarf. And, and now you see, again, it's 1%, so it's easier. So that's one reason why we uh, know a, a bunch of Earth-sized planets around red dwarfs. They're easier to see. There's another reason, which is uh, for the planets in the habitable zone. I said the planet needed to be a lot closer to the star. That means its orbital period is going to be faster. So now the duty cycle isn't a year, it's maybe a couple of weeks. Um, and that really helps as well. So for those two reasons, um, a lot of the discoveries of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone are around red dwarfs, just because they're quite a bit easier to find. Professor, what's the yeah. definition of habitable zone? Oh, we're getting there. Okay. <laughs> just hang on to that one. Uh, okay, so the, the, you know, the main transit mission to date has been the Kepler satellite. It's actually still operating today. Um, this is the basic result from Kepler. So before Kepler, we knew mostly about <clears throat> these kinds of planets. And Kepler had the sensitivity to get down to Earth-sized planets. Uh, it was, you know, that was tough even for Kepler. So the reason why there aren't so many down here really is that Kepler couldn't really see them very well. Um, so we actually think there's a ton of them down here as well. Uh, we just couldn't detect them. But you can see there, there's a huge mess of planets uh, in the size range between Neptune and Earth. We don't have one of those in our own solar system, but they're very common. So, I mean, in that way, we're a little special, I guess. Um, and if you look at the frequency of planets, well, that's a little tricky. So, first of all, uh, most planets do not transit their star, right? The, the orbital plane <laughs> isn't exactly lined up with us. Uh, so, but you know what the geometrical correction for that is. Um, and then, you know, you, you, know, you don't know, you, don't, uh, you can see them much more easily if they happen a lot than if they happen rarely, and so on. So people work on correcting uh, the number of planets that Kepler actually saw to what the real frequency of planets is. Uh, it's still, still a little bit of a game, but um, I'll, all I want to point out here is uh, these numbers here are sort of 10 to 20 percent. Um, and also the, the size here, this is sort of, um, well, this is sort of Neptune sized. These are these uh, sort of between Earth and Neptune planets. This is Earth sized here. Um, but the other thing that um, you need to know about this is this is just for planets whose orbital periods are 100 days or less. So the other problem Kepler had is, you know, it was up there, sorry, <laughs> up there for four years. Um, we wouldn't really believe a transit unless we saw it three times. Uh, and so you really couldn't detect, you could barely detect planets that have a one Earth year orbit. So it was much more sensitive to planets that had short orbits. Um, so this is the frequency of planets in short orbits. That doesn't mean there aren't planets in longer orbits as well. So, you know, the bottom line of this is most stars have planets. And when people did this exercise just for red dwarfs, they concluded that sort of every red dwarf has planets. And many of them are Earth-sized. So again, I just want to emphasize they're very, they're very common. All right, but, but you know, what are they like? So I, I've been very careful here to say Earth-sized, not Earth-like, all right? <laughs> we don't actually know what they're like. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in particular, uh, even just the size of the planet uh, does depend on what you try to make it out of. So, so here's uh, for a one Earth mass planet uh, made out of various things. Down here, I'll read them in, in a bit. Uh, you get a different sized planet. So here, this is what a pure, an Earth, si an Earth mass planet made of pure iron would be this big. This, by the way, is, is the sun here. Um, this is what the Earth actually looks like. 
Uh, here's if you make it out of pure carbon. Looks kind of the same. Uh, th here's if you make it out of pure water. It's a little bigger. Um, this is what you do get if you make it out of pure hydrogen. Now, of course, the universe is basically full of hydrogen. Um, but we, do, we think that it's actually hard to make an Earth mass planet out of pure hydrogen. That's, that's actually, it's actually hard to collect the hydrogen on such a small body, basically. Um, so if we go to five Earth masses, uh, here's the same set of compositions. And you can see, you know, this is about the same size as that. So you're not sure, uh, just ab initio, what you're looking at when you see a planet of a certain size. Well, you'd, you'd all, yeah, question. Are you able to determine the, the mass of the planet by the... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are you guys are just ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, so it would be really nice to know the mass of the planet exactly. <laughs> um, and and the original way of finding um, planets around other stars was actually this method. So the idea here is uh, if you have a star and a planet, uh, what happens is the planet orbits the star, but really the star also orbits the planet, or more technically correct. They both order, orbit their center of mass. Now the center of mass between, say, the Sun and Jupiter is inside the Sun. Uh, between the Earth and the Sun, of course, it's practically at the center of the Sun because the mass uh, difference is so large. Um, but the, the star does move. And, uh, and it moves at a rate, sort of at the rate you, for Jupiter around the Sun, the speed of the sun around its center of mass is kind of, you can, I could drive faster than that in my car, basically. Um, so it's hard to measure, but you can measure it with, with the Doppler shift. So basically we take a spectrum of the star, and to the extent that it's moving, the, the spectral lines will shift back and forth a little bit. Uh, not much. It's, it's actually about a part in 100,000. <laughs> so it's a very delicate measurement, uh, and that was what made it not happen until uh, the mid 90s. Um, but once you get that, uh, you can measure the mass of the star, or at least the, the mass of the star in the plane of your sight. So, so you could, if you imagine you're looking at a star and the planet is going around it and you're looking down the pole, uh, then all the motion of the star is not towards or away from you, and so you don't get any Doppler shift. Uh, and so this method also has a has a um, ambiguity, but you don't have that ambiguity if you have transiting planets, because now you know <laughs> you're in the orbital plane of the planet, otherwise it wouldn't transit. So that removes that ambiguity, and you do get actually the mass of the star, I mean of the planet, uh, from this method. And so uh, that has started to tell us what it is that we're actually looking at. So on, here I have a plot of the density of the planet. So if you know the mass and you know the size, then, then you know the density. You, you know the bulk density. You don't know what the density profile is or anything, but at least you have a total density for the planet. Um, so this, this uh, red line here is if I build up planets the way I built up the Earth, um, this is how the density would go up with the size of the, of the planet. Why does it get denser? Well, it's a heavier thing. It's got more gravity. It kind of crushes itself more. And so as you add more mass onto a, a planet like the Earth, um, it does actually get somewhat denser. So um, <clears throat> here's the planet radius. This is uh, one Earth radius. Here's one and a half Earth radius. And the density uh, of the Earth is sort of here. Um, and it these are measured densities, the, the, the blue points are measured densities of exoplanets that are, that are this size, okay? And what, what was found is you get up to about one and a half times the size of the Earth, density goes up, and after that, uh, the density goes down as the planet gets bigger. So that's not Earth-like anymore. Uh, something, something is going on there. And in fact, it goes down pretty fast. So by the time you get to two Earth radii, uh, it's down here, and three Earth radii, it's down here. And basically, Neptune is sort of over here. 
This is Uranus and Neptune, these two diamonds here. Um, so what we think is at this point, uh, up to about one and a half times the size of the Earth, you're talking about a terrestrial planet. And you know, the mass of that planet could actually be uh, several Earth masses here, um, but it's still a, kind of a rocky planet. But if I go uh, to two Earth, Earth radii, I'm not looking at that anymore. The only way to really make the density drop like this is if I do have a, a, you know, a, a massive planet there uh, made of rock, if you like. However, on top of it, I put some hydrogen and helium. It, it turns out it doesn't take much. I can take 1% of the mass of the planet and make that be hydrogen and helium, and the radius now is bigger because I can't see through that, that hydrogen envelope. So remember, with a transit, you're just measuring the size of the thing that's blocking light from the star. So you can block light from the star with an atmosphere as well as you can block it with, um, with rock. Um, and so now we would say, uh, these are our mini Neptunes here, and these are super Earths over here. And I mean, actually, there, there's not much super Earth space because that's already Earth. <laughs> so between here and here is super Earth. So you can get a, a one and a half Earth radius super Earth, and that's about as big as you can go. And then to make it bigger than that, you have to add hydrogen, and then it, it, it's not really a super Earth anymore. Um, it's a mini Neptune. And those are not uh, interesting in terms of, of habitability. Okay, so, so once you get there, uh, the, if you ask yourself, what's, what's it like at, you know, at the surface? That is the rock surface of the, of the planet. Um, there's enough atmosphere up there that the pressure at the bottom is, is um, thousands of times what it is here on the Earth. And in order to sustain that pressure, uh, the temperature has to get much, much higher. So, so at the bottom, the temperature, uh, bottom of the atmosphere, the temperature is going to be thousands of degrees, and the pressure is going to be thousands of bars, and that doesn't sound too good. So we really don't think uh, any planets like that would have any life on them. Uh, and that's all of these. So, I, so when people publish, when you read the paper in the future, and they, they oh, we found a, you know, an Earth-sized planet. It's, it's just two Earth radii, and you know, it's, it's in the habitable zone. You can say, well, yeah, but it's not habitable. <laughs> uh, it's, it's nasty. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have too deep an ocean, you get the same sort of problem as well. All right, so I've been talking about habitable zones. Let's, let's be a little clearer about what we mean by that. Um, I was just at a conference last week uh, with the Breakthrough folks, and there was real strong consensus that we should all just stop talking about habitable zones altogether because, um, as you, I'm sure, know, there are all kinds of places we think about habitability on, like, for example, Jupiter's moon Europa, which is completely not in a habitable zone. Right, but it's got a, it's an icy moon, it has a warm ocean underneath, and stuff could live there. Um, so what, what do we really mean by habitable zone in this context? What we really mean is if you, if you took the Earth and you put it in this zone, it wouldn't get totally wrecked. That is to say, <laughs> it wouldn't freeze over completely, and, it, and the oceans wouldn't boil off either. Um, so it's habitable in that sense. So it's kind of like a, a Goldilocks zone. Um, so, you know, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's kind of just right. Um, however, that's for the Earth. If you put something else there, you know, as I just said, you know, if it's a two, two Earth radius thing, it's not habitable anyway. It doesn't matter where you put it. Um, and so uh, this really has a pretty limited meaning. But and, and we don't know what any of these planets' atmospheres are like or, or what, what, how much water they have or anything. So when people say, I found an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, you could say, oh, that's, that's nice. I, I wonder what it's like. Um, because we really don't know yet. Okay, Who so. Um, it's been around for a long time because as people started thinking about, you know, life on other planets, the only kind of life we know about is, is Earth life. And so we thought, well, it would know, be nice if it was Earth-like. 
and it won't be Earth-like if it's not in a habitable zone. So, so that's, you know, that was sort of the argument. But now, the, this was actually before people had discovered all the extremophiles on the Earth, for example. So now we know there's life, you know, three miles underground in the middle of rock. There's life in volcanic vents at the bottom of the sea. There's life in, you know, boiling pools in Yellowstone that are full of acid. So <laughs> those didn't sound too habitable either, but they are. Um, so again, we don't, the biology part of this is not, you know, we, we don't know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you can still think about, okay, well, you know, would, if I put the earth there, would it, would it be habitable? Um, and uh, that depends on how much energy the planet's getting from the star. And so for a sun-like star, you know, there's a certain zone if you go too close, it's too hot. If you go too far, it's too cold. Again, um, we don't really know what we're talking about. So this, people draw the habitable zone for our solar system, sort of stopping just around Venus, because we know Venus isn't very habitable. Actually, I, I shouldn't say that. So <laughs> at this conference last week, uh, this was a, you know, one of those speculative conferences, people were really talking about life on Venus. Uh, you may be surprised to hear, uh, in the clouds. So it, it's actually true that, that if you go up 30 kilometers from the surface of Venus, you're in thick cloud. It's uh, kind of room temperature. Um, there is, uh, there's a lot of chemicals there, not so much water, but you know, there's acids. And as I said, some organisms like acid. Um, so they, anyway, they're talking about that. As soon as you start talking that way, of course, you can talk about life on Jupiter. That's also got thick clouds at room temperature. There, there is plenty of water and also a lot of organic material. So if you're going to go that way, you know, I, frankly, Jupiter is more habitable than Venus, but okay. <laughs> In terms of the solar system, if you took the Earth and you moved it, you know, to, to where Venus is, uh, it wouldn't look like Venus. Uh, Venus has a different atmosphere than we do, quite, quite different, and I'll get back to that later. If you took the Earth and put it where Mars is, it'd be cold, uh, but it wouldn't be nasty like Mars because it has a nice atmosphere at least, and Mars doesn't really. And I'll get back to that point as well. Um, so habitable zones are, um, you know, they're an interesting construct, uh, but don't take them too seriously. I guess the other point I want to make though is because red dwarfs are so faint, the habitable zone is really tiny compared to other stars. So that's something to keep in mind. On the other hand, as I said earlier, uh, it's really easy to find planets in that tiny zone, and so we're finding them. So there, there are planets in the habitable zones of red dwarfs, certainly. So if you start thinking a little harder about it, you know, it's like, well, okay, if I did put the Earth there, you know, what would, what would happen? Um, well, greenhouse effect is pretty important. So that is why Venus is not habitable. It had a runaway greenhouse effect. So the surface temperature of Venus would be quite a bit cooler if it didn't have a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. So if you put, that's why I said if you put the Earth there, it would be uh, much cooler. Not, not probably cool enough, but certainly much cooler. Um, you know, on the Earth, you've got this whole carbon cycle going. How about this other planet that we're talking about? Does it have a carbon cycle going? Well, that's, you know, that involves, are there oceans? Are there plate tectonics? How much volcanism is there? And so on. Uh, and so we don't know any of those things for these planets either. So just, again, uh, they might or might not uh, have the requisite um, things. And, and even uh, on the Earth, we think biology itself has helped mitigate the, the uh, help sort of regulate the greenhouse effect on the Earth. Because we know the Earth has had liquid oceans for um, essentially the last three and a half billion years. Um, it turns out the sun has been getting brighter that, all that time and it was you know, like a quarter fainter at the beginning of that um, because of the way stars work. Um, and so actually habitable zones also move. That's, that's this point here. So the, where the habitable zone is depends on how old the star is as well. Um, but the Earth is somehow adjusted and, and you know, people talk about, well, 
you know, early on we had a greenhouse effect due to methane. And then cyanobacteria started eating all the methane and producing oxygen. Uh, and then CO2 became the main greenhouse effect, you know. And now humans are doing their best to, <laughs> you know, enhance the CO2 content. Maybe we don't really want to do that, but um, that will raise the temperature of the Earth, Earth's surface as well. So with other planets, unless, until you know what the atmosphere is doing, you really have little idea what the actual surface temperature is. What, you, we can, what we can calculate is, if I just had a bare planet there and the, sun, the star was shining on it, what would the surface temperature be? Then there, there are other considerations, like uh, how much energy does the planet actually absorb or reflect and re-emit? So this is, here's a cloudy planet. That's actually a picture of Venus. Venus completely covered with clouds. They're pretty reflective. So Venus reflects a lot of the energy the sun puts on it. Nonetheless, it's real hot. <laughs> and that, but that's because of the greenhouse effect, okay? Um, well, this is a, an ultraviolet picture of Venus, actually. If you take a, a visible light picture of Venus, uh, it looks really blank. It just looks white, because it's very reflective in the visible. Uh, it's not so reflective in the ultraviolet, so you can see cloud features here. What about red dwarfs? Well, if, here's, here's the visible part of the spectrum. So the, this is the, between here and here is where your eye works. And this is also the, uh, the black curve here is where the sun emits. No particular accident, presumably, that our eyes work where the sun emits, right? <laughs> Some evolution probably had something to do with that. Um, this is a red dwarf. So uh, this part of the spectrum here, your eye doesn't see at all. This is the infrared part of the spectrum. Most of the energy from a red dwarf actually comes out in the infrared. So it would look kind of orangey to your eye, but you'd be missing most of the light from the star. Uh, most of that would be in the infrared where you, you, you wouldn't see it. How would the planet look in the infrared? That's the relevant thing to, to, to figuring out how reflective are the clouds and so on. And so here, here just for fun, is the reflectivity of some various things, also as a function of wavelength. Um, so this is the visible part. So let's take snow, for example. Oh, snow is really reflective. I think you knew that, right? It's really white and bright. Uh, not in the infrared. The reflectivity drops down, way down here for snow. Snow looks black to infrared light. If you cover the planet with snow, it absorbs more light, <laughs> unlike if you had a sun-like star. So that, that, that's a complication that uh, one really needs to pay attention to. You know, here's land. Uh, so land isn't particularly reflective in the visible, but it's more reflective in the infrared. Um, here's ocean down here. That's, that's uh, pretty flat. So, you know, what does your planet actually look like? Does it, does it have a bunch of land? Does it have a bunch of water? Does it have a bunch of clouds? What's the mix? And then, you know, what kind of star are you around? All those things go into the question of what's the, what's the temperature like at the surface. But there's a, there's a more um, difficult property of red dwarf planets in the habitable zone. And this is the reason that uh, up until about 10 years ago, I'd say, um, most astronomers, not me included, uh, would have said, there's no way you're going to have life on red dwarf planets. They're tidally locked. What do they mean by that? Um, well, our moon is tidally locked. So you all know the moon keeps the same face towards the Earth all the time. It's not that the moon doesn't spin. <laughs> it does spin, but it spins in exactly one orbital period, right? So that, that means that you have this situation here. So if you're looking at the star here, you spin a quarter, you go a quarter of the way around and you spin a quarter and then you're still looking at it. That will happen to uh, red dwarf planets in the habitable zone. Here, here are different kinds of stars. Here's the temperature if you like. The M here stands for red dwarfs basically. Um, and this line here is the tidal locking radius. So 
Um, and the, the green points here are the ones in the habitable zones. And for M stars, you can see they're all under this black curve. Why is that? Well, they're so close to the star that the star's gravitational field actually distorts the planet a little bit into a little bit of an egg shape. And the egg wants to point at the, at the star. That's true for our moon as well. Indeed, the moon is actually doing that to the Earth, right? Some, some of you probably know. <laughs> so, so we get, yeah, we get tides on the ocean, but actually the whole planet experiences a little bit of a tide from the moon. So we're slightly distorted. Um, and we'd like to also just point at the moon all the time. Uh, right now the Earth spins, you know, in 24 hours and, and it takes the moon a month to go around, so there's a big mismatch. But the moon is working on us. So when you, when you hear these announcements of a leap second at the end of the year, that's because the Earth slowed down a little bit. And, and it's going to keep slowing down until it keeps the same face towards the moon all the time. Now that's not going to happen for a while, um, about 15 billion years. Um, and by then the moon will have receded somewhat because that's part of the exchange. And so our day will be the same as the moon's day, which will be the same as the, the month. And that'll be about 45 current days. Uh, now, on, on a red dwarf planet, that process happens a lot faster. You've got, you, now you've got a star instead of a planet pulling on you, and you're real close to it. So uh, in less than a billion years, the planet gets locked onto the star. So that means on the planet, you know, there's one point that where the star is overhead, and it's always overhead there. You know, and then there's a whole side of the planet that never ever sees the star, that gets no starlight ever. So there's a, a day side and a night side, okay? The planet does not spin uh, in the, relative to this. It, it spins once per orbital period. So if you live on the back side, you never see, a, you never see your star. If you live on the front side, you never have night. And obviously it's gonna be warmer <laughs> on the day side than, than the night side. And what people worried about originally was, okay, a star never shines on this side. It just sees empty space. Um, it's just gonna get colder and colder and colder. The atmosphere is gonna freeze out finally. And you have you know, liquid nitrogen and then it'll freeze and, and the whole atmosphere will, this is basically a giant cold trap back here. It will freeze out the atmosphere and then the atmosphere on the front of course will rush around to try to fill that and it'll freeze out too and and so yeah clearly clearly not habitable wrong luckily <laughs> that's not right um i'll i'll explain why in a minute but even even this it turns out is is actually trickier than um uh, it first looked so uh what if you have more than one planet in the system so like the trappist system you got seven planets packed in within the orbit of Mercury. Um, now it's harder to lock planets because uh, the other planets are pulling on them as well. And in fact, uh, you know, those of you who are sophisticated know that Mercury has this weird spin resonance, spin orbit resonance, where um, every full Mercurian day is two Mercurian years long. So tidal lock means one day is equal to one year. Here, one day is two years. <laughs> it's a strange two, two to three resonance caused by Venus and the sun. Um, so that's fun. Uh, but but that's, that's because Venus is there, right? Uh, in the Trappist system, all the planets are pretty close to each other. They're pretty massive. You know, several of them are more massive than the Earth. Uh, this is the sort of orientation of the planet um, uh, over time. And you see it goes crazy. <laughs> so instead of locking, it uh, just starts wildly oscillating um, just because of the influence of the other planets. So the Trappist planets probably are not tidally locked. They, they bother each other enough to prevent that. But, you know, okay, what if, they're not, what if there aren't a bunch of planets right next to each other? It's still okay, it turns out. So, you know, now we have sophisticated uh, climate models. We can, we can do other planets. We can say, well, you know, what, what, what gravity do you want? You know, what kind of atmosphere you want? How much insulation do you want? And so on. And, and okay, let's have it only on one side. You can do that. 
Um, and now the models tell us that uh, even a one Earth atmosphere will uh, redistribute heat fast enough to stop the backside from freezing out. Okay? So the wind pattern will be like this. Um, so you will have a hot spot on one side and you know it'll be cool on, cooler on the other side. Um, but it will not freeze out the planet. Okay? And in fact, uh, there's a way to actually measure uh, these models, not for Earth-sized planets yet, but for Jupiter-sized planets that are close to their stars. We, uh, the ones that transit, um, so when it transits, you're looking at the, at the dark side of the planet, right? Um, as it comes around this way, you know, it's just changing phase. You know, so this is, here's the new planet. The full planet is over here, right? <laughs> Actually, the, the very full planet is behind the star, so you wouldn't see that, but you'll see it most, almost full. Um, and you can measure the total brightness of this system as the planet goes around, and of course the total brightness changes because the brightness due to the planet is changing. So if you're very careful, <laughs> you can actually see the, the phase curve of the light of the planet. And you can infer, if you do that in the infrared, you can kind of infer what the temperature is on the side of the planet that you're looking at at the moment. And so people have actually confirmed that this is, this is what happens. So that's good. That, that removed that objection to red dwarf planets not being habitable. There was another objection. This is what the other objection goes like. So any, any star or planet uh, could produce internal magnetic fields by means of what we call a dynamo. If you have these three ingredients, you need a conducting fluid inside, you need convection, so the fluid has to sort of boil, go up and down, um, and you need rotation. Well, everything rotates, so that's not a problem. Um, conducting fluid, uh, well, all stars are, are plasmas, so they're all conducting, so that's not a problem for stars. Um, Convection is, is a problem for some kinds of stars, but not for red dwarfs. Red dwarfs are fully convective. Um, for planets, that's a little less clear. So the Earth has a conducting fluid in it, right? Liquid iron. Um, Mars doesn't now. So Mars cooled off, the liquid iron froze, so then there was, there's no convection now, and Mars doesn't really have a magnetic field. Venus doesn't seem to have one either. That's more puzzling, frankly, but Venus has very slow rotation, so maybe that's why. So, so, you're, so it's not a given for, for planets that they'll have magnetic fields, but they certainly can. It is a given, though, <laughs> for stars and especially for red dwarfs. They're all rotating, they all have uh, conducting fluids, and they're all fully convective. Which means that you get a lot of magnetic fields, which means this picture that you all, all keep seeing of red dwarfs is intended to convey that effect. So all the, all the structure you see on here is due to magnetic fields on the star. So here, these are fields on the sun, just so you, you believe me. Here's, here's the Earth. <laughs> I mean, these are, these are big structures here. Um, and they're full of energy. Um, and that's, that's the problem, basically. Uh, this is a, these loops actually are called coronal loops. You can see they're above the surface of the sun. The temperature in these loops is about a million degrees. Temperature on the surface of the sun is only 6,000 degrees. The, why, why are those a million degrees? Because a lot of magnetic energy is being dissipated, basically. So there's electric currents flowing in here. Uh, things are shorting out. Um, and there's a lot of power getting dumped there. And the fact that that's so hot means that it puts out a lot of um, high energy radiation. So it's, it's, uh, its dominant luminosity is actually in X-rays. Million degree plasma emits primarily in X-rays. So that, that's not nice. Um, and the, the surface here is, is sort of still hot enough to emit uh, in ultraviolet. So the, the Bottom line here is if a star is magnetically active, it is not going to just put out, you know, nice um, warm radiation. It's also going to put out uh, very nasty radiation. 
<laughs> even worse than that, uh, sometimes the magnetic field gets tangled up with itself and reconnects, and then you dump a huge amount of power uh, in a short amount of time. So these are called flares. This is, these pictures, by the way, are also taken in x-rays, basically. Um, but here, there's a flare just starting to go off. You can already see the instrumental splatter pattern uh, due to the x-ray optics, and here it saturates the detector. It's so bright. Um, and here, here's the sun, which is behind this occulting disk here. Uh, a flare has gone off, and, and now you can see this huge structure. This is several solar radii in extent. Uh, these things, the sun is blasting these off into interplanetary space, um, mostly when it's active, so that's sort of half the time every 11 years. Um, and yeah, we get hit by some of those, right? So these are called coronal mass ejections. So the, the sun is, this flare puts out a burst of x-rays and UV. That gets to you at the speed of light. Uh, there's also a huge burst of high energy protons that comes off of that. They get there uh, not too long afterwards because they're moving at almost the speed of light. Uh, and then you get stuff like this, which takes about a day to get here and will hit us also. How does that affect the planet Earth? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> so luckily the Earth's got its shields up, right? <laughs> All right? What's our shield? Our shield is our own magnetic field. So it turns out, uh, at least for high energy particles, uh, they're charged. They can't just cross field lines. That's not easy. They'll, they'll, they'll want to flow along field lines. Um, and so for the most part, the, the protons and electrons and stuff that the sun fires at us, so that coronal mass ejection, that was actual protons and electrons, that will be deflected mostly by our shields. The x-rays and UV, though, of course, don't care about the magnetic field, so those do hit us. And, you know, what stops them? Our atmosphere. So our atmosphere is thick enough that that stuff doesn't get through. You know that because you, you, you put suntan lotion on. That's to catch the, uh, the extremely uh, mild UV radiation that just manages to get through. All the harder stuff uh, can't get through the ozone layer, for example. That was why people really didn't want to mess the ozone layer up because <laughs> then we'd be getting more of it. Um, so we have two sets of shields, the magnetic field for the particles and our atmosphere for the, the high energy radiation. Okay, great. And I've explained why we have that field. So let's talk about red dwarfs again. Turns out the sun is a wimp. <laughs> it actually didn't used to be. So actually early in the Earth's history, when there was life on Earth, uh, the sun was far more active than it is now. It was 100 to 1,000 times more active. Uh, so we were getting slammed back then. Of course, there were no multi-celled creatures on the Earth, and, and the, the single-celled creatures mostly lived under the sea, <laughs> so they, were, they actually were protected. Um, for younger stars and for red dwarfs, uh, you, you can get like a thousand times as much activity, okay? So uh, red dwarfs in particular have a reputation for large flares. Yeah? Our yeah, yeah, there are, right. Our shields are not completely effective. Um, so if you get a really bad blast here, uh, most of it goes around. Some of it uh, manages to, so the, this stuff carries a magnetic field as well. And if the direction is right, it can kind of uh, neutralize the opposite direction in our magnetic field. It tends to come in. Uh, gets into our magnetosphere in the, in the tail here and then flows back towards us uh, along these field lines, which you'll notice terminate at the poles, more or less. Uh, and then when they hit the atmosphere, it makes it glow, and we call that the aurora, right? So, so the aurora is solar particles that manage to get into our shields and come back and hit the Earth they get stopped by the atmosphere, so the aurora stays pretty high. Uh, but if it's intense enough, uh, you get enough currents flowing in the upper atmosphere that it will 
and, and did um, 12 years ago or something in, in Canada, it took out the grid, right, because there was enough uh, voltage in the, sort of in the air to, uh, to cause an overload in the, in the electric grid. Those are rare, that's right. Well, more rare, right? Um, there was an event called the Carrington event in 1856, I think it was, where the flare was so strong that people actually could see it in white light, briefly. <laughs> there was almost no electronics on the earth at that time, but uh, a few telegraph wires sort of picked up this burst. If, if that happened today, and it'll, it'll happen eventually, <laughs> Uh, it would take out most of, you know, most of the internet and the electric grid. And, and then not to mention, of course, we have several thousand satellites orbiting the Earth, doing a lot of communications and stuff. Those will, those will be toast, for sure. Um, <laughs> Is that permanent so, toast or just temporary? Uh, for them, it'll be permanent. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to put new ones up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that, I mean, this, you know, the Carrington event probably only happens once every couple centuries. Um, well, we have found with, uh, actually with Kepler, so with Kepler can see white light flares on other stars, so we were pretty surprised to find that there are solar type stars that don't appear to be that young that have super flares on them that are, you know, a hundred times stronger than anything we've seen here. Um, we don't quite understand that phenomenon yet. Um, it doesn't look like the sun is going to do that, but it will sooner or later it'll take out, you know, take stuff out. <laughs> um, but that's really, you know, that's humans with their electronics. That's really not, you know, not a planetary problem. Uh, it might be our problem. Uh, but these things, uh, on red dwarfs, the actual brightness of the star can increase by 20 times when the flare goes off. I mean, so these are, you know, you can imagine what, what we would do if the brightness of the sun suddenly went up 20 times. Uh, that would be quite an, quite an event. So that, that does happen on red dwarfs. And then, of course, there's the, you know, the high energy particles as well. Um, and then there's the fact that you took your planet and moved it right up against that. <laughs> so that's not so good. <laughs> So these, these events are, are more powerful than the ones on the sun, and now you're sitting way closer to them. So that that's truly is of concern. <laughs> um, but maybe not in quite in the way you're thinking. Uh, the real concern is the planet's atmosphere can't really take that indefinitely. Um, so apart from the radiation risk of, to life, uh, this steady flow of high energy stuff uh, can, um, can actually erode away the atmosphere if you don't protect it well enough. Um, and that is probably the main, that's now the main beef against um, habitability on red dwarf planets is can they actually keep a decent atmosphere? So this is not all theoretical either. We have two planets in our own solar system that have suffered these kinds of effects. One, one is Mars. Um, so Mars, as I said, uh, froze early, lost its magnetic field. Uh, now it's a smaller planet, so the atmosphere wasn't held as tightly either, right? Um, but that basically what's going on now is, the, the, in addition to these events that we've been talking about, the sun also blows a steady, a steady wind of, of charged particles out with velocities of something like 600 kilometers per second. So there's this steady wind of protons from the sun um, and no shields at Mars. And so these protons hit atmospheric mole molecules in Mars and just um, take them away. And in fact, there's a spacecraft around Mars now called the MAVEN, which is actually run from, uh, part of it is run from Berkeley, uh, that's measuring the uh, Mars's at current atmospheric law. So we, we actually can see we can see the, the gas going away um, on Mars. So that's why Mars is, is so, uh, has such a low atmospheric pressure. It's, you know, it's partly that it was a small planet, but it's also that the sun is just stripping it. Yeah? So since Mars doesn't really have much of a magnetic field, is there any point in terraforming it? Well, this, I mean, the time scales for this, you know, are, are long compared to human concerns. So if you manage to terraform it, you know, that would last for, I don't know, 
maybe a million years. <laughs> so, you know, from our point of view, I suppose, yes, there's a point, but yeah, eventually you'd lose it again, right? And Venus also has suffered. Now, Venus didn't lose its atmosphere. It's, it's, so it's, it's one Earth mass, basically, and that had enough gravity to hang on, even though it doesn't have a magnetic field. Um, and in fact, it's, it's atmosphere, as I said, is much, well, no, maybe I didn't say. So the atmospheric pressure at the surface of Venus is about 90 bar, 90 times that of the Earth. Um, so why is that, you know, especially given what I just said? Well, the, the reason is that um, the Earth's atmosphere would also be that thick, except that all the carbon dioxide that was in the Earth's atmosphere is essentially in rock on the Earth. And how did it get there? Uh, it got dissolved by the oceans and turned into limestone and, and like. So uh, if you took all the CO2 that we know about on the Earth that's in rock and you put it back in the atmosphere, then we, <laughs> I mean, you think humans are bad. <laughs> <laughs> then we'd get a runaway greenhouse effect in a hurry and we'd have a very thick, dense atmosphere. So, so, you know, so Venus didn't have the benefit of oceans, apparently, to dissolve all that CO2. Um, and uh, why not? Well, it was closer enough to the sun that the water that it did have, and we do know that it had water enough for oceans, um, remained as steam, because uh, it was hot enough. And the sun, as I said, was much more active in the early days. And so the steam uh, in the upper atmosphere of Venus was hit by all this UV and X-ray radiation, split the hydrogen from the oxygen, and then took away the hydrogen. The oxygen was kept, it was heavy enough. Um, but the hydrogen was lost. Of course, if you lose your hydrogen, you can't reconstitute water later on. And so Venus is, you know, essentially waterless. Uh, for that reason, again, it's the star that did it, right? It's the UV activity from the sun that took away the hydrogen, both in breaking up the water and then stripping it off afterwards. So, uh, yeah, we've got to take seriously the question of stellar activity on, on planets. There's a, a further unfortunate fact about red dwarfs, which is um, when stars form, uh, they shine mostly originally not by nuclear reactions, but actually just by gravitational contraction. So they're, they're formed, they're shrinking to their final size, basically, and the shrinkage releases way more energy than even nuclear reactions do. Um, and it, red dwarfs, it turns out the smaller you are, the slower you shrink. <laughs> uh, so that means that, um, you know, here's, here's the sun's history. This is the fractional luminosity compared to its sort of resting luminosity. So we're, we're at one now. And this is millions of years here. This is zero, this is 50 million years, 100 million years, 150 million years. So the sun drops like a rock, basically, and after 10 million years or so, it's at its final luminosity, pretty much. Not so for red dwarfs. Here's where you make rocky planets. And so, um, so you have a problem that in here, the star is brighter than it's gonna be later. Super active. This is the most active magnetic time for the star in its life. Um, and, uh, and you make the planets while that's still happening. And so you can, you can um, so, eat, so what's going to be in the habitable zone when we're looking at it now is not in the habitable zone then. It's too hot then. And so the oceans wouldn't be able to be liquid. If they're, if they're able to be liquid now, they would not be able to be liquid then. If you want to be safe, you've got to come out here, but then they're, they're liquid then, but now they're going to be frozen because <laughs> the star got dimmer. So that's, that's the other sort of issue uh, with red dwarfs is they, they contract slowly enough that it really presents a problem for the early planet. So is it possible for planets to form further out? Sure. Over the billions of years, get to a closer orbit? Oh, well, yes. That's probably possible in some cases. We certainly see a lot of planetary migration in the first few hundred million years. 
So yes, that, that's possible. I'll, I'll come to, to uh, ways around this short, shortly. <laughs> okay, so just, just to, to say, the most serious problem for habitability of red dwarfs that we know of at the moment is this water loss problem, okay? So they stay hot too long, they, the water can't condense, they're irradiated by super intense UV and X-rays. Uh, we actually see planets losing tons of hydrogen you know, in our telescopes. Uh, this, is, this is a spectral diagnostic. Where it's basically the hydrogen line uh, from a star. Uh, and just all you need to see is that this is for three different loss rates. You'd get this curve or this curve or this curve. And the data, you know, is on this one. And that's 10 to the 10 grams per second <laughs> uh, coming off to, to give you that, that spectral line. So, so we actually see we see these uh, tails of hydrogen, you know, being stripped off of planets. Uh, so it's not like this doesn't really happen. All right, so, so do we give up on red dwarf planets? Well, nah. <laughs> I mean, we're pretty creative. Nature's far more creative than us anyway, but, but I can even think of ways around this, right? So, um, so let's bring the water back later. Well, go ahead, let the star strip it, right? Uh, and then you can, you can have a lot of comet impacts later on and put the water back. Um, that might be a reasonable possibility. For example, you know, in our solar system, Jupiter cleared out most of the comets. But in red dwarfs, uh, Jupiter-sized planets are quite rare. So the typical red dwarf system has Earth-sized planets and maybe some Neptunes, but no Jupiters. So there are probably a lot more comets still left in the, in the disk. Um, now, of course, you don't want to be on the planet while that's happening. <laughs> so, so I guess we have to wait, you know, to we'll resupply the water and, and let things calm down, and then we'll have life. But remember, we have, you know, 100 billion years to, to do this, so. Um, <laughs> or, uh, you know, probably even more easy is just, just have uh, a lot of water stored inside the planet and then put it out uh, through volcanoes later. It's a, it's a remarkable fact to me that we don't actually know the water content of the Earth's mantle. The geologists are still arguing, and they're arguing within an order of magnitude or so, so we really don't know what it is. But the, there's water in there, and, um, and it can come out later like that. So that, that's an easy solution. So you let the star settle down, and then, uh, and then put water back in the atmosphere. Or, as, as you suggested, uh, maybe you could migrate the, the planet inward. Or, uh, here's a good one. Uh, we had this problem earlier, but let's use it to our benefit, right? Maybe you have uh, a mini Neptune to begin with. Let the star go at it. Tear off all that hydrogen, or almost all the hydrogen, right? Uh, and just leave enough for a couple oceans. Um, so, you know, that would be more contingent. Uh, but this is also observed now. We, we actually see there's sort of a, a, a valley of size in planets when you get to a certain distance from the star where it looks like um, those planets that are there are, they're smaller because they've had their hydrogen stripped. So the, the, the statistics are such that they look like they were many Neptunes, but they look smaller. Uh, and so apparently stars do strip, you know, hydrogen envelopes off of many Neptunes. And in fact, we actually see that in the planet statistics. Um, so if you do it the right way, you could end up with a, with a decent planet later on. All right, so, so we're near the end now. Um, are they nice or not? <laughs> are red dwarf planets habitable or not habitable? Well, um, you know, probably some of each, right? Uh, we can come up with scenarios where they're good. We can certainly come up with scenarios where they're not good. Uh, you know, so maybe some look like that and some look like that. Um, so let's, let's have a little fun here thinking about that a little harder. So all these problems about uh, water and so on and so forth, they really actually only apply to the side of the planet that is facing the star, right? I mean, I can protect water easily by freezing it out on the dark side of the planet, and the star can't get at it anymore. And it's not vapor either, <laughs> so I, I can't make it go away. And so I can just have a big collection of ice on the backside, 
You probably do on a lot of these planets, right? So, so it's, it'd be like extreme Antarctica, right? Antarctica does get some sunlight, a, a low angle, but it gets it six months of the year. Here, never a star, never. So, so I think you probably do have to think of the backside of M dwarf planets as, as being really, really cold, <laughs> really frozen, dark, frozen. You know, does that make it uninhabitable? No, no it doesn't make it uninhabitable. For example, uh, maybe there's a thick ice shell and then there's a warm ocean underneath, like, oh, Europa, right? So, yeah, um, there's no reason why that can't be true. And in fact, these Earth-sized planets, or you know, even you know, three Earth-mass planets, are going to have more internal heat. They, they're going to have plenty of internal heat for a long time, um, and that'll come out as volcanism. Um, and if you've got an ocean on there, even if it's frozen at the top, the bottom will be, be warm. Um, stellar high energy radiation, couldn't care less, right? You may not even care what kind of atmosphere you have, right? Doesn't really matter above the ice shell. Uh, what matters is what's below the ice shell. So that's the back of every planet, basically, as long as there's water there. Well, uh, even on the front side, if you live in the ocean, uh, you're protected from the high energy radiation. It takes about a couple meters of water to stop anything, basically. Any, even if there's no magnetic field, and there you get the high energy protons directly from the star, <laughs> water is going to stop them. And of course, we've been thinking about that for astronauts going to Mars, for example. How do we shield them from the solar radiation? That one idea is, you know, you keep your water tank between you and the, and the sun. Um, then that, that certainly helps. Um, and people have even talked about, you know, the fact that all this high energy radiation in the atmosphere creates all kinds of interesting chemistry. Now, you want to get it, then get it in the water before the, it gets torn apart some more, right? But it, you do get many more interesting combinations. Then, uh, you know, there's the, the twilight zone, right? This, uh, so, it's too, maybe too hot here and too cold there, but what about in between? Now the star is, you know, always just on the horizon. So, Obviously, the temperature changes from here to here, so somewhere in between, it's good. Uh, you know, maybe that's the only zone on the planet where you have liquid water and life and so on. Is in a, a thin belt right at the terminator. Thought. Or we can, you know, pull the planet back some, so most of it's frozen, but you know, the substellar point is warm enough to keep the ice melted. Uh, and there's all kinds of scenarios, right, you can start playing with here. So I think the, the, um, the message I'm giving you is basically, nature is very creative, and there are a lot of these planets out there, right? Most, most stars are red dwarfs, most of them have Earth-sized planets, you know, maybe, maybe life-bearing ones are, are rare, and that means there are only a million of them. <laughs> so, uh, this is just a, a, ro a little bit of a rogues gallery. Sort of the best planets we have right now. Uh, Prox NB is really interesting because it's, it's right there around the nearest star. I, I have to say, though, that uh, we don't actually know the size of Prox NB. That was discovered by this Doppler method. It doesn't seem to transit its star, and so we don't actually don't know how big it is, which should give you great pause, right? You know, it's like, so if it's three Earth, three Earth radii, forget it. But um, anyway, everyone's fascinated by that one right now. The TRAPPIST uh, system has seven planets, three of which look like they're a reasonable size and in a reasonable place as well. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And some of the other ones are these mini Neptunes. So they have plenty of water on them. So it's not like there's not water in this system. Um, so that's a pretty interesting one. Um, this is actually my favorite right now. So here we know the, the distance of the planet from the star. We know how bright the star is. We know the, how, the size of the planet because it does transit. And we measured its mass as well. 
and it all looks good. So this is called LHS 1140B. That was found last year. Um, and uh, that one, you know, I, I don't know of any objection to that one at the moment, other than all the objections that I've been talking about. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, you can dream. Um, maybe, you know, this is a picture of, potentially a picture of Proc, Prox NB. So here's the Alpha Centauri A and B system. So that, that's a solar type star, or maybe that one is, and that one's a slightly less massive. And then here's Prox N itself. And as you may or may not have heard, you know, the, the breakthrough starshot folks are, are thinking about how to get there. Not for people to get there, but for a tiny chip <laughs> with some interesting data, data gathering capabilities to get there. Um, and it's unclear whether it's actually technically feasible, but they propose to take a, a sort of meter square um, of material, which is ultra reflective, <laughs> it can't absorb hardly anything, and then hit it with a gigawatt laser. Uh, that's why you can't absorb anything <laughs> um, for about five minutes. And then it will be going at about uh, fifth the speed of light, and it would take, um, you know, 30 years to get there. So that's, you know, if you, if you could pull that off, we could, you know, be visiting Proxen uh, maybe by the end of the century. Don't count on it. <laughs> there are a ton of technical problems. And it tur turns out that, uh, that y there's no way to sort of, well, actually, I shouldn't say there's no way, but, you know, if you don't slow down, that you go by at 0.2C. <laughs> so it turns out you don't get much of a look either. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, what, what is really meant, uh, as I said earlier, all, the only thing that's really meant is if I take the Earth and I put it there, it isn't completely uninhabitable. <laughs> that, that's really all that's meant. Could there be another term invented that doesn't leave us with that kind of confusion? <laughs> yes, uh, you know, we've thought about it. So f I, I think, for example, uh, liquid surface water zone would be better, except that still assumes, you know, the right kind of atmosphere. Um, so other than that, you know, maybe uh, um, earth insulation <laughs> term would be a good term. And so you're getting about the right amount of energy from the star on the planet. That's really essentially what, it, what that means, the habitable zone. Yeah. Uh, you had said that the planets around the star remain hot for a long period, and that's, I think, because the Yes. Uh, the, so the question was, why did red dwarfs um, sort of stay bright uh, and hot longer? And it's it is be just because they contract more slowly. Uh, so they just take longer to get to their on the zero age main sequence, if you know what that means, or their final resting, <laughs> their their final stable place takes, you know, um, 200 million years instead of 10 million years. So it's, it, it also has to do partly with, you know, I mean, their behavior, a lot of it, you know, is quite different than the sun. So the, the final luminosity is way lower as well. So it's just that the um, effect of gravity, uh, you know, has a big effect um, uh, with mass. The, just the way stars work has a has an outsized effect on how the, the luminosity of the star behaves. Yeah. Can you remind us also why the red dwarfs have incredibly powerful flares? So why do red dwarfs have incredibly powerful flares? The, the main reason is that they're really fully convective stars um, and they, um, they also slow down more slowly. <laughs> 
they contract more slowly, they slow down more slowly, so they're spinning fast longer, which, and the faster you spin, the more magnetic field you get as well. Um, there, there's some complications there, but th those are the two basic reasons. They're fully convective and they they're, um, tend to be more rapidly rotating, at least for a while. Yeah? Uh, so my understanding about the thinking on whether we can get to any of these planets is we can't. We sort of discussed that when we talked about the, the, the robot object. Yeah. Is that still the thinking? Right now, that's basically the thinking, yeah. <laughs> right, right now, we have no way to get people there. Um, even, I mean, except, you know, if you want, you want to take a really, 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 really long time, then, then you could, <laughs> you, your, your distant descendants could get there. Uh, uh, you know, be, Far, far beyond your grandchildren. <laughs> um, I, I, my personal thinking about that is that's it's a dumb idea to send people there. Uh, either we, you know, have sophisticated AIs and we send them there, or you uh, just send DNA there with uh, a laboratory to reconstruct life at the other end. Uh, that's much easier. Uh, it takes way less life support and so on. <laughs> so. So I, you know, if, if you were going to get people there, that's how I'd get them there. <laughs> yeah. We talked a lot about um, the type of lobby, that there are two types of atmospheres, the one with sun, the, the hot zone, and then the one with that, and there might be a gold box in the twilight zone. Doesn't that make the whole concept a little bit unsustainable? Um, if there are, we have a like, the they even last long enough to well, you, you have a good point, which I didn't talk about, which is that um, because I did say that the atmosphere is capable of redistributing the heat from the hot side to the cold side, that means you're going to get pretty nasty winds. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so in between, it's true that the stellar um, uh, energy might be a comfortable amount, but the you know, what, what the atmosphere is going to be doing is moving the heat from the front to the back. Um, so, but, you know, uh, somewhere <laughs> there might be the right distance or, or level of stellar energy that, that that is okay. It's sustainable in the sense that it's, it's a pretty equilibrium situation. So the, when the star settles down, it's giving you a certain amount of energy. The atmosphere has to redistribute that. The planet's rotation is locked to the star, so everything's kind of stable in that sense. So whatever gets set up at that point is probably pretty stable. Uh, and whether it's nice or not, you know, is another question. Uh, you know, if you have an ocean though, um, then that's better. So water will take heat much, much more easily. And, um, you know, different depths in the ocean will have different conditions as well. So there you may be able to find a, a good zone uh, that's, that's stable. Here and then way in the back. Oh, yeah. What about the uh, smaller stars yet, um, the so-called uh, brown dwarfs? Uh, I don't know whether you consider these, or you would consider those stars because <laughs> they don't really shine by nuclear reaction. But uh, there will be enough radiation or heat, perhaps, to support very close orbiting planets. So his question was, how about planets around brown dwarfs, which people are looking for. Um, and of course, I'm a brown dwarf expert. <laughs> uh, so the problem with brown dwarfs is they don't have a stable luminosity. So they, they are constantly fading. So wherever you think it's nice, uh, after a while, it's too cold. <laughs> um, so you, yeah, they're not, they're not stable. They just aren't stable. Uh, you know, now what the time scale that, you know, it passes through a particular place is nice. Uh, you know, that's, it's probably not long enough for any interesting life to evolve, but yeah. So the basic problem with brown dwarfs is they just don't have a stable luminosity. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to make this into one question. <laughs> um, but before you mentioned how there's evidence for planets possibly migrating Afterwards, um, after the collapse or something, and 
fast and hurry or sorry, the binary system. And then I wonder, you know, what is, how does that relate to the plans that are, like here as we prepare a center, like intersecting orbits, and Okay, so uh, I'll, try, I'll try to collapse that into one answer. <laughs> um, so first of all, the, the binary frequency of stars turns out to depend on its, uh, their mass. So almost all high mass stars are multiple. Only about a quarter of red dwarfs are multiple. Sun, for sun-like stars, it's about half, which is where your half number came from. So that's one, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is we do find planets around in, in binary systems. You can get them in one of two places. Either you are um, only uh, a quarter uh, as far from your star as the other star is from your star, so inside a quarter of the distance separating them, or four times further than the separation of the stars out there is also um, stable. So you can have planets that go around the whole binary system, or you can have planets that go around one of the stars as long as they're close enough to that star compared to where the other star is. Uh, and we do see planets in both those situations. And then, you know, the question of wh how much energy the planet's receiving depends on the separation of the stars, the type of stars, where the planet is, et cetera. Yeah. And we'll have to have you back again in a couple more years. <laughs> I, I will hang around at the back if you have more questions. <laughs>